And now, Barton Seaver with Jennifer Morris of The Nature Conservancy. All right, well, good afternoon. We have a really interesting session that we're going to start right now about seafood. Healthy Hello. communities and seafood in our relationship with the oceans. And I have here my new friend, Bart Seaver, who is an absolutely incredible guy. So oh, you have done so much in your life when it comes to your chef. You worked with Jose Andres. I did. Yeah. You are a health expert, worked at Harvard. Yeah, yeah. You are an author of many, many books, eight books, eight I believe. Books, yeah. Eight books. And um, you have called yourself a seafood evangelist. Uh -huh. Okay, but let's, let's talk about this for a minute. So I'm the CEO of the Nature Conservancy, mm -hmm. and I have to say the fisheries industry, especially the wild caught fisheries industry, is one of the worst on the planet, right? Bycatch, forced labor, but yet you call yourself a seafood evangelist. So tell us a little bit about yourself and why you would consider yourself sure. a seafood evangelist. Well, thanks, first of all. Just the honor to share stage with you and to all of you. I, I wore this t-shirt on purpose because uh, all of us love something. I think all of you love hope itself, and I love you for that. So thank you all for all the work that you do. Um, yeah, so I'm a seafood evangelist. I grew up in uh, Washington, D.C. in a very multi-ethnic neighborhood called Mount Pleasant, where there's a lot of Eritrean, Ethiopian, Guatemalan, Andoranian. And, uh, you know, interesting time to be growing up in D.C. back then. Yeah. Uh, but I really learned the power of food through those communities and those uh, peoples who were escaping civil unrest in their own countries, uh, largely. And that really pushed me onto a trajectory of really caring about food. I worked in restaurants, worked my way up, lived and worked all over the world, uh, and had the great mentorship of Jose Andres, a gentleman Robert Egger, founder of DC Central Kitchen, where I learned, again, sort of the deeply humane, the humanitarian aspects around food. Mm -hmm. And I became very interested in seafood in my restaurant, simply because it's the most interesting palette of ingredients to work with. I mean, it's just fun. But also at that time, coming up is really when we were beginning to understand full the impacts that we were having, the, the incredible damage that we could do to ecosystems. And also, as a chef myself, I was beginning to understand the damage we could do to our own bodies through the choices we make for dinner. And the other side of that coin, though, is if we can damage and make, and make sick, we can heal and we can restore. And so I began a campaign around in my restaurants just around sustainable seafood, really understanding the source, the provenance, and the purpose of the products that I was serving. And then I had opportunity to sort of further that. And I walked into the world as an explorer for the National Geographic Society. And I set out to do the, help do the work of getting people to fix seafood. And while I was out there, in the world doing this work, seeing the incredible work that so many NGOs were doing and people, other chefs, I would begin to understand that seafood could be incredibly sustainable. That when done right, the terrible, terrible ills that plague the industry can be shown to be solved. And so I began, instead of asking people to fix seafood, I began to see an opportunity to use seafood to fix people to create op economic opportunities, to create positive environmental outcomes, and to create certainly positive public health outcomes. And so I am a seafood evangelist now. I see this as a means to inspire and to spark new economies, new ways of thinking and relating to our world through the foods that we eat so intimately, taking into our literal body through food, the transcommunication of the world into ourselves. Uh, and well, while there is still a ton of work to be done out there that your organization and so many others are so bravely and nobly doing, uh, I believe that we should look at seafood largely as this category of solutions. So, so great. I love that, that answer. And I'm just curious, Bart, so you, you know, you've focused so much of your career on looking at the intersections between the health of our bodies and what we put into them and seafood. So a lot of folks would say, okay, well, we know that there's, there's lots of chemicals in the fish that we eat, right? So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on, you know, certification. So how do people, how do consumers, like those in the audience here and listening online, how do we make decisions about what seafood we should be eating? Because it's almost a dizzying array of, 
of certification standards and you know I have my little Monterey Bay Aquarium card that I take to restaurants with me but I'm like okay which one is it now and it needs to be updated and all that it's confusing yeah so I call tell it. us what tell us how do we choose what we should be eating how do you navigate the alphabet yes, chowder exactly. I call it um, yes sure you've got BAP GAA ASC but in all of these <laughs> all those, yeah and all of them to some degree are largely to a very large degree really do represent a great choice behind it and really very rigorous audited work behind it. And it's the large companies. It's Walmart. It's McDonald's. It's Red Lobster. It's Darden, the world's largest per, you know, by purchasers of seafood that have really done this work. And at the outset of sustainability, quite honestly, sustainability is a sort of unsexy idea. Like, if we all revolutionize the world, right, what will happen? It will stay the same. Like, right, right. You know, it's, yeah, do you want your marriage to be sustainable? No. Yeah, no, we want, we want it to be thriving, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. So this idea that sustainability is sort of a cover your ass, you know, approach right. really has evolved now to looking at seafood as a solution to some of the diet related issues that we have. And certainly certifications are a big part of our decision making process as individuals, but also for companies. Companies. Uh, but there's a larger paradigm in effect here, and that is that seafood is somewhat considered guilty before proven innocent. Well, I've heard that seafood's farmed, and all farmed seafood's bad. Well, that has Fukushima radiation, and this has methylmercury in it, and slave labor over here, and like, oh my god, these are terrible things, and we've got to address them. But the bottom line is, is that doesn't paint the entire picture. And when we look to the American diet, the Western diet being a protein-centric center of the plate, we need to look at seafood in that context. How does it then stack up against beef, pork, chicken, lamb, veal, turkey, which is really what we eat, over 200 pounds plus per person per year? Well, if we look at seafood versus those other proteins, well, across five very important metrics from freshwater use, land use alterations, antibiotic use, uh, feed conversion ratio, and carbon emissions, seafood simply has a fin up in the sustainability game. And why? Well, because you and me were fighting gravity and atmospheric pressure and keeping our brains and blood warm and all this stuff that we have to do to fight this, to exist in this relatively harsh environment. A fish? <laughs> no, dude, I float. It's cool. <laughs> so they're just bio, there's a biological efficiency there that we should take advantage of. And when it comes to the American diet in particular, uh, looking at top, top causes of death, diet and uh, lifestyle-related diseases, Look at seafood begins to be a moral choice. If Americans were to decrease the amount of red meat that we eat and increase uh, servings of seafood, omega-3 rich seafood, to twice a week, we would reduce cardiac mortality incidences by 36%. We would reduce overall mortality incidences by 17%. We would improve the quality of, uh, of cognition, development in pregnant and nursing mothers, as well as in preserving cognition, eye health, helping to manage diabetes, mood disorder. I mean, it is incredible. So it begins to look like a moral issue. So much so that I would say, and uh, Darius Mozafarian, dean of Tufts School of Nutrition, says the three S's of public health are don't smoke, wear your seatbelt, and eat seafood. It's that important. So when we begin to look at the moral issues around what are our choices on the dinner plate, seafood begins to look pretty good. And when we could begin to look at sort of the larger paradigm of how that seafood is produced and what good can come from those systems, socio-ecological systems, we yes. look pretty good, and that's where your work really comes in. Well, yes, but I will push back a little bit, because in addition to what you just said, and I agree with you, we know that seafood has six times less emissions than beef, for example. So from a climate perspective, here we are at the Aspen Climate ideas session, it's really important that we think about. However, we also know there's some really big issues, macro issues with the fishing industry, the wild caught fishing industry in, in particular. And one of the big initiatives that the Nature Conservancy is working on is trying to disrupt that industry. Because for example, with tuna, skipjack tuna, which is sort of the tuna that you get in your, your tuna fish, is rife with challenges, not just from the bycatch and the forced labor, but also the fact that the countries who supply this fish are getting pennies on the pound for the fish that they're allowing to be fished from their waters. So how do we disrupt that? And we're working with the Republic of Marshall Islands on a new company, basically, that's gonna enable the Republic of Marshall Islands, instead of just selling their vessel days and getting pennies on the dollar, to actually maintain 100% of the net profits for their 
fishing. And that is so critical right now because it's a huge part of their gross domestic product. And these countries that have relied on tourism during COVID are absolutely devastated. The, one of the only other natural assets they have is their fish. So how do we disrupt that industry in a way that will support those countries? We were really um, excited that Walmart is gonna be our very first buyer awesome. of this new company's fish. So that's kind of, I think, really important as we think about seafood and the seafood industry, that it, the, the, the aspects of, yes, the lower emissions are really important, and as you mentioned, the health, but we've got to change the economic models around the fishing industry. And I think one thing that's exciting that's happening is aquaculture. Now, again, there's been lots of discussion about the, the sort of the value of aquaculture, but there's also lots of challenges. When we hear about aquaculture, we hear about, oh, we're, we're actually raising fish to feed fish. That doesn't make any sense. Why are we <laughs> doing that? Or we're clearing mangroves to grow shrimp. Why are we doing that? Does that really make sense? Love to get your thoughts on, on the aquaculture sector in particular. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to mention also at the outset when, when we're talking about disrupting the economics, like wouldn't it just be easier to not fish? You know, uh, well, yes, in some circumstances, but that's a rather dire outcome for other circumstances, which is that almost one in 10 people on this planet are wholly dependent upon fisheries for their livelihood. One in 10. Seafood represents 2% of the global food supply, but 10% of the livelihoods on this planet. Its impact is so outsized that we must consider wild fisheries as part of the human heritage and our future. Where does aquaculture come into that? Well, that's the huge disruptor, is that we can now create. We are literally witnessing the creation of a food system. The last time we got to do that was about 10,000 years ago when we planted the seeds of civilization with agriculture. And we are witnessing it, these generations right now. And, and you know what, we got it wrong at first. And there, there were a lot of abuses that we still hold the industry accountable to, but largely a lot of those, those mistakes have been addressed. Monterey Bay Aquarium has green listed farmed salmon. I mean, we have solutions to a lot of the issues. And when you look at just farmed salmon, fine, that's sort of the poster fish, if you will, but then there's a whole subset of species that, I mean, we've only ever really grown about 100 species of seafood in aquaculture. And the industry is about 55 years old, right? I mean, things advance very quickly. And so when we look at farm-raised shellfish, we begin to see I mean, just incredible opportunities, and this is nearshore. When we look at kelp, we have incredible opportunities. I mean, we have some represented here in the audience. We have Running Tide, uh, Marty Odlin from Running Tide, and their kelp uh, and their carbon sequestration um, that, that they're doing there. We, right here in Florida, you've got an incredible program, All Clams on Deck, which is helping to plant clams to remediate environmental issues and nutrient overload while also restoring uh, eelgrass, which has a, uh, which is, 10% of the carbon uh, on this planet is absorbed through eelgrass. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's just incredible the, the outcomes that we can have with aquaculture. And what's amazing is that it's all delicious too. And it begins to put us into, especially with shellfish aquaculture, a new sociological ecosystem. And what does that mean? It means a system that's based on relationships and cultural expectations around conservation ethics. It's based on a mutual understanding of the purpose of a food system, which is the endurance of thriving humans, where the entire watershed is considered a single system. For all the way from Mount Katahdin all the way down to the Gulf of Maine, or from the Mississippi River and headwaters all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, where everybody becomes vested in a single system mm. that ultimately produces economic outcomes, a generation of sentinel stewards on our waters, standing there sentinel for us, creating delicious food that sustains our bodies. So let's pick up on that for a second. So oysters. Yeah. So we talk a lot about, about oysters and how amazing they are. 50 gallons of water per day are being filtered by oysters. So if you have any choice in seafood that you would eat, farm-raised seafood, oysters would be it, right? Yeah, yeah. farm-raised mussels, clams, oysters, kelp, scallops. Kelp, I've never had a kelp sandwich, I don't think. <laughs> it's coming, don't <laughs> it's coming? worry, okay. don't worry, it's coming. Coming to a restaurant near you. Um, well, one of the things that we didn't mention about oysters, which is also, I think, very compelling other vis-a-vis -vis other types of aquaculture, is its climate adaptation benefits. Yes. So specifically, we worked um, on a project called SOAR, supporting oyster aquaculture and restoration, including here, six projects here in Florida, 
where we're able to buy, during COVID in particular, buying oysters that got too big and they couldn't sell, the oyster farmers couldn't sell them. So we supported 125 different oyster um, organizations, uh, oyster businesses, and took those, those oysters that they couldn't sell and we put them into natural reefs to protect against storms and, and sea level rise as well, but mostly for storms. So the oysters are really, really incredible. I, be, I didn't really eat oysters that much, but now that I learned all of this about it, how incredible they are, I am now an, an oyster evangelist and, yes. and definitely eating it all the, can, all, all the time I can. But what else? Let's, I mean, we don't have a ton of time left, but I love just to hear your thoughts on, you know, again, if you're thinking about the choices that you should make as a consumer when it comes to seafood, help our audience understand what they should be eating and how they should be choosing what to eat. Well, thanks for that. Well, I, I think first off, we need to just decide that seafood is part of dinner. It is also part of our future. Um, one of the big obstacles to increasing the amount of sustainable aquaculture is a lack of social license. Mm. And the idea that, I mean, the oceans haven't been mentioned a whole lot yet in the sessions that I've been sitting in. Uh, they're 99% of the livable space on this planet, 70% of its surface. They are the, ecolo the ecological driver of this planet. And we consider land beautiful for our presence there, cultured even, but we consider the oceans beautiful for our absence there. And as we envision a new future, a new ideation of just humans' presence on this planet, what does it look like? I would ask you all to just consider seafood and consider specifically aquaculture, especially farm-raised shellfish and bivalves. What needs to happen is for us to see ourselves on that water. I mean, if I ask you to picture a farm, you know, the, the settler America vision of the undulating hills bathed in autumn splendor setting sun with perfectly patterned rows of corn leading the eye off into the distance with a perfect house, white paint, you know, paint chipping the red barn color fading like hot damn, this is the fabric by which, this is the thread by which the fabric of settler America was found, was built, right? But when we consider a, f a farm or a fishery, we might stand on a dock and gaze wistfully out at the wine dark sea and think as though a fishery happens elsewhere executed by someone other. But turn around on that dock and look inward and see the quality of education and the quality of opportunities that people have to stay in their place, to become stewards of their own legacy, mm -hmm. to be in a place. And when we see a fishery or a farm as such, we see our own values reflected in it. We see it as the sum of the labors and aspirations of a community. And especially with aquaculture, what is so important is that as Cheyenne opened this entire session with, we all stand on indigenous land always, and the coastlines in particular. And this is an opportunity for us to rematriate the commons of our oceans into the communion of our commons and to learn from 10,000 years of sustained native uh, uh, fisheries and even farming of shellfish on our coasts, to learn from that knowledge, to right those wrongs, to eat deliciously, and to thrive. Love it. Well said. Thank you.